Good morning. Good morning. Oh, don't get up. Save yourself. No, you're going to have to. Thank you. Oh, is it any wonder? It is absolutely could not be any wonder in my mind that this is the most wonderful day because you all are always so gracious, so wonderful, but I should be here applauding you. You understand what we're trying to do here. Uh, my colleagues and I know that we have to do a lot of explaining to our colleagues to try to get these budgets up. But uh, I really want to congratulate my dear friend Jim Moran. We were elected the same year. Uh, and this is going to be a very hard year for the Congress of the United States. I'm not sure you know it, but some giants are leaving us this year. Henry Waxman from California, who did so much on safety and health. Uh, John Dingell, who watched everybody like a hawk and made sure everything went well. George Miller, who kept education going in the right path and working so hard. And my buddy Jim. And I will tell you that uh, uh, working with him, uh, if you get down, and you really feel bad, you want to go see somebody like Jim Moran. I think it's the Irish. I'm Scotch and I'm not supposed to be happy. <laughs> yeah. While I was home on break, I visited one of the high schools in my, uh, in my district, a suburban one. Uh, our city school district needs a lot of help. Even though we spend $23,000 a year on each pupil, we only still get a, about a 40% graduation rate with maybe 10% ready for college. But this school, 12, over 1,200 students. And when I got there, the band was practicing Shostakovich. They were going to, uh, to Boston for a concert and a competition. The jazz band was extraordinary. I could hardly believe they were high school kids. And they were ready to do Miss Saigon, and they were building the helicopter themselves. Over half those kids are on the honor roll. And I know, and those school administrators know, and those teachers know, that giving those children access to art has opened up both sides of that brain, and they are doing great. We need to do that all over America. As Jim said, we have to fight so hard to get this budget up. It still isn't as high as it was when I came here. 24 years ago. Isn't that a shame? Because it gives us back in the Treasury, art programs in this country, $10 billion a year. Now, what kind of an investment can anybody make and get that kind of return, as well as creating so much happiness, so much beauty, so much serenity, letting people really renew themselves? And we've all done it. Now, every, I've been coming for years, as you know, and I've never done a speech that my staff helped me do, and I'm going to do it in their honor this year. <laughs> okay, staff. <laughs> as many of you know, my involvement with the arts stretches back to the earliest days, growing up in the mountains in Kentucky. In college, as I uh, mentioned, I sang with a band called Tinker Baggerly and his orchestra, mostly engineering students. And it was the truest joy of my life to stand there and have that music rise behind me. I came from a family that sang all the time. And the night I was elected to Congress, my husband swears I told him this, on the way home after we'd gotten the results. Now, I just won a seat in the House of Representatives. I said to him, well, all I really wanted to do was be a blues singer. <laughs> you know, Congress is pretty good. And I, did, I, I can't believe that he swears I said that. <clears throat> So I'm still proud to be an advocate for the arts because of what they did for me. Uh, in these days, it's more important than ever that the advocates share the powerful story that art has to tell. It starts with the incredible educational benefits that arts programs provide to our children. High school students who enroll in music classes score an average of 102 points higher on their SATs than their non-music peers. That's up from 57 points. It's getting better. Through federally funded programs like the Big Read, our nation is, uh, is combating the uh, decline in literacy, especially among young adults, and restoring the rate and uh, the role that literature played in American culture throughout our history. The skills learned through exposure to the arts are not elective or optional. 
which is why the arts should remain a central component of every student's education. Amen. Amen. Exposure to the arts not only provides our children with emotional, with social and intellectual outlets, but they teach our students skills they need for a multitude of jobs. From working in creative fields such as graphic design, becoming a doctor, as you know, I tell you every year that the only doctors who really understand what they're hearing in a stethoscope are doctors who study music. That's been proven by the University of California at Davis. Now, federal funding for the arts also contributes to the nation's economic success. Each year, the nonprofit arts industry generates $132.5 billion in economic activity. That's no small thing. And provides 4.1 million full-time jobs. As we rebuild our economy and create American jobs, investing in the future of the arts is the best place to start. These are some of the reasons why Congressman Lance and I and many of my colleagues here are leading a letter requesting funding to be the 156 million. And I think we're gonna get it. We're gonna work very hard to do it. But the most important reason that I'm proud to lead the Congressional Arts Caucus is because the arts continue to serve as a shared memory that unites our diverse nation. Whether through song or dance or visual mediums like painting and photography, arts tell us who we were, who we are right now, and who we hope to be. On the night of November 18, 1861, Julia Ward Howe awoke in her hotel room at the Willard Hotel just blocks down Pennsylvania Avenue from where we are now. Seven months earlier, the American Civil War had begun at Fort Sumter. Troops were now on the march across a divided nation. But on that night, Julia Howe rewrote the lyrics to a soldier's tune. And three months later, the Battle Hymn of the Republic was first published and it quickly became a rallying cry in the fight for one nation free from slavery. I so much love the second verse, which is the most poetic and beautiful thing and always makes me cry. It starts, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigured you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. How much more beautiful can you get than that? In the decades and centuries that followed, the Battle Hymn of the Republic became ingrained in our collective history, has been performed by American artists ranging from Judy Garland to Johnny Cash. And 150 years later, when our wounded nation on September 11th tried to struggle to comprehend the terrorist attacks that left more than 3,000 Americans dead, it was the Battle Hymn of the Republic that resounded from the pews of cathedrals around the world. I will never forget the incredible rendition of that sung by the, Paul, the choir at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. They told us that our nation would once again survive as it had when she wrote those lines, and we would see brighter days. It is the intangible and timeless uh, value of the arts we advocate today and don't let any of these people you talk to tell you that it is not a value for us. Thank you for joining us in this effort. Thank you for your absolute tireless support of arts, and you are preserving our nation's shared memory now and forevermore in all time to come. Thank you. It is no small thing you're doing here today. Thank you for making the trip, and thank you what you do for 365 days a year. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.